Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this virtual event. Our presentation is 3D printing in radiation therapy with Dr. Michael Yunus, Chief of Radiation Oncology at the Demore Center for Cancer Care. All attendees will be muted, but please type in your questions in the Q&A box. I wanna thank Dr. Yunus and you for sharing your time with us, particularly Dr. Yunus for sharing your expertise with us this evening. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody. And uh, I, it's an honor for me to give this uh, talk and share with you what we've uh, been doing uh, over the last really five or six years and how we've uh, changed and modernized some of our uh, care to provide the best and safest care available, uh, not just regionally, but really uh, around the world. So first, before we uh, start, the first question we have to address is, uh, what is radiation therapy? And, and I would be remiss if I didn't show this picture because my 16-year-old daughter drew it on her iPad. Uh, so you have to you have to share when you can. So radiation oncology, uh, radiation therapy is energy, just like light. And it, as you probably remember from your high school chemistry or physics, right? Uh, light is uh, waves uh, of energy, and it starts from the lower energy radio waves, and it increases in energy up through the visible light, then to ultraviolet. Then you get into X-ray, and the higher energy and sh and uh, uh, shorter wavelengths means means the X-rays can pass through tissue. As you get to higher energy, the wavelength is even higher, and you get to the gamma waves uh, and gamma rays, and that's what we typically use. Those are X-ray high energy X-rays or gamma rays. And what they do is damage the DNA of the cells. They actually create DNA strand breaks in the cells. And those uh, those cells that have the damage, when they go to replicate and uh, split through mitosis into another cell or into two cells, the damage is repaired in healthy cells, but that damage cannot be repaired in cancer cells. Uh, so radiation therapy is the utilization of different types of high energy to uh, create that damage. Typically, clinical radiation therapy utilizes either the photon, which is the light particle, um, which is the elementary particle responsible for electromagnetic radiation, uh, and light. It's just much higher energy. Photons are emitted in many natural processes. Uh, in uh, the clinic, we create photons through linear accelerators. The electron is a fundamental subatomic uh, atomic particle. You, again, probably remember from the Bohr model of the atom, it's that negatively charged uh, particle that uh, is it lives in a shell around the outside of the nucleus and balances the positive charge of the proton. The proton you may have heard in the uh, in media is also used clinically uh, for clinical radiation therapy, but the machines responsible for creating the protons artificially uh, are uh, massive uh, behemoths, hundreds of millions of dollars typically, so they're uh, limited in uh, um, lo location and in utilization right now. Um, but uh, as with everything else, price will come down eventually if the uh, market is there. To perform clinical radiation therapy, modern uh, techniques rely on CAT scans. So we, uh, it used to be that you would uh, lay a person down on a table and shape the beam with lead cutouts and block the radiation where you don't want it, just uh, sort of like putting a slab of lead in front of a, uh, a, a flashlight to prevent it from getting the light from getting where you wanted it. But we have modernized how we create that radiation beam and how we create our treatments now using CAT scans to create three-dimensional three uh, representations of patients uh, in the computer. The first form of radiation, even when using CAT scans, was called two-dimensional radiation therapy, and that's really simple imaging where, where as I said, you're, you have a fixed beam, you're blocking radiation based on anatomy, uh, but it's really a fixed picture, uniform intensity across the whole beam, which is really more or less a flashlight, but blocking off different portions of the beam. And that is what this looks like. This is a uh, an X-ray of, or what's called a digitally reconstructed radiograph of a person's hip. And this is an open portal, meaning a port film uh, showing a beam of radiation getting uh, delivered to the hip. Everywhere that is inside this rectangle uh, is getting is getting the same amount of radiation, regardless of where it is in that beam. And that's 
called uh, the that that means that the uh, beam is a simple two dimensional plan. Three dimensional conformal radiation therapy actually shapes the beam to the patient's anatomy, but it's still usually a fixed beam, and the the beam ha still has a, a uniform intensity across the field. Meaning, what we do is we can actually we can take multiple beams from multiple different directions and shape those beams to the anatomy, but the same way that the two-dimensional beam has um, the, the same amount of radiation anywhere in the beam, uh, the three-dimensional beam has the same thing. There's just more of them. Uh, this is a uh, three-dimensional representation of a patient that needed radiation to uh, the breast tissue. And this is being planned with what are called electrons, which are those negatively charged particles. And as you can see, this is really directed to the skin's surface. And what we do is we rely on the physics of the uh, uh, different energies and the different particles to determine what energy we're going to use and how we're going to deliver that radiation to the depth that we're prescribing. On a three-dimensional uh, view, this is what's called a sagittal view, so sort of cutting horizontally from front to back. Um, you can see that the depth of the tissue in the blue that we're actually targeting is in the middle of that uh, of that anatomy. And the dark red blocks are literally lead blocks shielding off the areas of the breast tissue that we don't want to radiate. Different energies of electrons have different what we call depth dose curves. So what you're seeing here is a, uh, a depth dose curve where the amount of the percentage of energy is on the left, where the top is at 100% of the energy, the bottom is at zero, and then centimeters in water is used to be analogous to tissue. The body tissue is mostly water, therefore water is an excellent surrogate. So you can, as you can see, those lines are uh, numbered by energy as you increase the energy from four to 10 megavolts or mega electron volts, the depth at which the maximum energy is deposited is deeper. So as you, if you look at the four megavolt, uh, mega electron volt curve on the far left, which is the blue, most of the energy is deposited before the first half centimeter of tissue. But as you go higher in energy, the maximum energy deposit goes to one, one and a half, two, three centimeters. Well, if I want to treat something that is that deep, I have to find a way of shifting that curve where I want it so that energy is being deposited exactly at the depth that I want it. This is a picture of a three-dimensional plan, as I mentioned. Um, so this is, again, a, a, these are blocks that are created either artificially or by the computer to block off different tissues, uh, to prevent radiation from getting where we don't want it. But everywhere within that tissue, everywhere within that beam is getting the same amount of, of radiation in that technique. So we started off with something called two-dimensional. And if, if what we really want is the perfect rep representation of a three-dimensional structure, such as on the left, um, then if you really did a rough cut, you would get what we call a four-field box, which is the second panel there. As you make it more and more conformal, as you shape it more and more accurately to what you want, eventually you get to three-dimensional conformal radiation and then image-guided or IMRT, intensity modulated radiation therapy. So up until now, everything that we've talked about has been the amount of radiation being delivered is exactly the same regardless of where it is in the field. IMRT can change the fluence patterns throughout the tissue, regardless of where it's coming from. So here is a breast treatment. This is bilateral breasts. And with three-dimensional planning, we can contour, but really all the dose is just, it's based on physics where it's coming in. The beams are modified only by simple shapes. IMRT, however, allows us to shape the radiation to the anatomy regardless of where it's coming in. So we can actually have an infinite number of beams instead of just two or three. The next iteration of this is called VMAT radiation therapy. And what that is, is the machine rotates around the machine, uh, around the patient while it's delivering radiation. The key difference is with IMRT, the beam changes as it's delivering the radiation. 
This is a picture of what are called multi uh, mini leaf collimators. And on the right hand side, you'll see an exposure through these open leaves exposing film. And these, these leaves are actually moving while the radiation is being delivered with film on the other side. And you can see based on the film exposure at the very end here, it's exposing a film differently depending on where it is in those what are called voxels or boxes of radiation. So that's the basics of radiation therapy of how we do it. So what, what's this all about 3D printing? Well, 3D printing is, is all the rage. You can do a simple search for Google on Google for 3D printers and you'll see thousands of options out there. You can print anything from a gun to uh, what our friends at UMass are doing with uh, printing respirators. Uh, we're not quite yet to where the Jetsons were printing food, uh, at least uh, not to the uh, complexity that, that they were. And we're not using replicators yet, uh, although again, um, we're, we're getting closer. There are places uh, and uh, companies that are creating simple foods with 3D printers, and uh, as interesting as they are, they don't look tremendously appealing yet. Uh, I'm sure they'll get there. But we have, ever since 2015, been using 3D printers for educational purposes. So this is a 3D print of a person's brain, and you can see here there's a brain tumor that we created in a different color that can actually be removed. So when we're teaching patients about their anatomy or about their tumors, we can actually show them in real, in real, uh, in, in true reality, what the position of that tumor is. Well, this kind of looks uh, a little bit uh, simple and it was one of our first trials, but here we can see a larynx cancer and the larynx can cancer is red within a mandible and the cartilage. And this is a multi uh, media different uh, printer with multiple different types of, pr of uh, uh, print media that we're using. But again, this gives a patient a much better sense of where their tumor is in real time and in on their own anatomy. So how do we use this for more complex things and how, how is it done? Well, the first thing you have to do is have an image. You have to have an image that you can transfer into the computer. On the left-hand side is an MRI and right here, is a tumor. And that tumor is then rendered in three dimensions in the computer uh, where you can see it right here. This is an acoustic neuroma or a benign tumor of the internal auditory canal. Then we can print that in three dimensions and you can see that in the body. And by putting it in this print, you can actually see how close it is to different critical structures like the brain stem, and the uh, acoustic, uh, excuse me, the, um, the other cranial nerves. Um, we can also print things like pituitary adenomas, which are benign tumors of the pituitary. And again, showing how close it is to the critical structures is important to understand what the side effects are associated with treatment. We also use it for surgical planning. So this is uh, what it looks like when you put, pull it into the computer, uh, you have your, your uh, large arteries and uh, the airways, and all of that can all be transferred into a 3D print. And this can then be used by the surgeon to figure out the best approach for a surgical uh, uh, treatment. So how do we use radi 3D printing in radiation? What's the, why is it used and how? Well, traditionally, remember how we talked about that dose depth curve, how, de how as the radiation penetrates into the tissue, it takes a bit of tissue to hit the peak energy. Well, if we want to shift that curve one way or the other, we can either add or take tissue away. Well, we're not going to be able to take tissue away, so we would just choose a higher energy if we wanted to penetrate deeper. But if we wanted to pull that energy closer to the skin, we would have to put something in front of it. And this is called superflab, which is an artificial uh, tissue, which is similar to water content tissue, and it would go over the skin to help pull that dose up to the skin. You can actually choose the thickness of this. We have uh, from two millimeters to uh, about uh, two centimeters, and you can stack them on top of each other. But the thicker they are, the more difficult it is to, uh, to wrap around a structure. And you can imagine that if you're trying to wrap a part of anatomy that is um, fairly well curved, 
uh, you're not going to be able to get a real nice tight fit. And so this is my arm with a, a one centimeter or a half centimeter bolus here and a one centimeter bolus. You can see how this bolus tissue is really not conforming very well to my skin. You can see there are air gaps. I would have to tape this with literally masking tape or, or tape to, to hold it together so that we can uh, prevent air gaps, which really is uh, something that's important so that we don't have a buildup of dose on the skin and have burns. So if the, if the goal is to create as tight a uh, bolus material as possible, the best option would be to find a way to print something that, mi that mirrors the tissue. So this is an alternative. If, if we print a 3D rendering of my arm and give it a uniform thickness, then we can print it. And what you see here in the center is this little square, this little, uh, this little cutout on the inside, and that allows us to put a little detector there that we can actually use to measure the amount of radiation truly being delivered. And uh, the benefit of this is we're getting real-time data, but we're also able to confirm the position. It's the same every single day, and the treatments are repeated, often up to six weeks. So accuracy, reproducibility, is key. So we started using software from the company Adaptive uh, about a year ago. And uh, although with uh, the um, pace of COVID changing our, uh, our goals and the delay of getting certain printers that we wish to get, we have been using the software clinically since that time. So this is a one of our first patients that we treated with uh, a 3D print, and this is a, a tumor that is on a, a tough location, which is the in, inner part of the elbow. And that's an area that is actually fairly tough to create a, a bolus effect on that is equal throughout the whole air, uh, throughout the whole uh, tissue plane. So by creating a 3D print and printing this, perfectly overlaying the skin and reproducible, not only, do we get to treat this in the best way possible, but it's customized to him, to this patient. When you look at, an, here's another patient with a tumor on the forearm, we can actually cleave the, to, the, uh, the excuse me, the 3D prints in half if the printer is not, uh, doesn't print large enough, which the current printer we have does, it cannot print large enough to go all the way around as we would like, but you can cleave them and have these little knobs that attach the two pieces together and this gives us a bolus effect. And what you're seeing here on the right-hand side is a CAT scan with the 3D plan using that 3D bolus in place. And down here at the bottom, we're not treating, but this is an air gap. And what you'll notice is there's no air gap up here. It's perfectly seamless. The other thing you're going to notice is that here to here is thicker than the 3D bolus is from here to here. This is called a modulated bolus. So we can actually change the thickness of this printed bolus depending on where it is on the person's anatomy. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but it actually makes the radiation even more conformal. It allows us to shape the radiation in ways we really can't do without 3D printers. And this picture here on the right-hand side proves that because we're getting the dose exactly where we want it and we're not getting dose down here where we don't want it. This is a patient that has a, uh, a tumor called, a, or excuse me, a process called Deputrin's uh, disease or Deputrin's contracture, which is a benign fibrosis of the uh, uh, cords uh, of your hand. The, what happens is over time, the um, tendons can start to become tighter and tighter and it can require surgery so that your fingers are full, can be fully extended. Uh, surgery obviously causes scar tissue. So if you have surgery, it gets tighter and tighter over time and then requires more surgery. And then again, you get more scar tissue. So an alternative treatment that is a little more frequently uh, done in uh, Europe is a, a simple course of radiation therapy. And uh, radiation for this is done uh, over uh, five days and then you get an eight week break and then you repeat it five days later. But you can imagine if we're trying to get to a certain depth in your hand, the tissue, the skin, and the, the subcutaneous tissue is different. Uh, the the depth, depth is different depending on where you are on the hand. So by doing a custom 3D print, 
we can change or modulate that bolus depending on how deep the nodules or cords are that we want to treat. The other benefit of this is it allows us to emboss the patient's name on here. It can also give us an orientation. So we can say uh, superior, inferior, left, right, but we can also make it so that it locks into the digits. So it locks in around the thumb or the fingers and essentially it fits like a glove. We then put it over uh, a, uh, an immobilizer and this immobilizer is just what's called aquaplast, which allows us to stretch it over the 3D bolus just for positioning on the treatment table so we can align it to lasers that come out of the ceiling and the walls to get it at the, in the right position. We then can treat this every day with the absolute certainty that the patient is in the right position, the hand is in the right position, the bolus is in the right position, and we can confirm that the dose is going where it needs to go because the first day of treatment, we're actually calculating the true dose that's being delivered. This is even more important when we're talking about other areas of the body like the nose. Uh, so the top left is uh, a picture of uh, a bolus that was created for a tumor that is on the nose. The left one is uh, a, a single thickness bolus. And on the right uh, here, you can see that there's a ridge and we created two separate thicknesses of bolus to, uh, tissue. So this fits right over the patient's nose. There's only one way it can fit and it's, con it's perfect every single time. <coughs> Excuse me. The one on the right here is really a skull cap. This is a patient that has had uh, severe sun damage from uh, the, uh, to the scalp and multiple skin cancers on the scalp. This is a tough area to bolus. Uh, what we would typically do is uh, put a piece of that super flab material on and either tape it down or have to somehow uh, stabilize it with an aquaplast mask. But 3D printing allows us to print this custom to the person's anatomy and it sits on like a hat. It's always the same. Again, we can test the dose and we can confirm the accuracy of what we're doing. One of the other tougher areas to treat is the perineum. This is uh, a uh, patient that might have uh, cancer of the anus or the vulva or the vagina uh, and trying to create a tissue equivalent that goes into that space to, to really get the dose that we want is very hard to do. As you can imagine, it gets harder and harder as the tissue gets more and more irritated. Typically we would use probably not bolus material, but wet gauze, wet gauze because it can be disposed of every day, but a 3D print like this can be sterilized, it can be cleaned. So we put it on in that space, it takes up the space and uh, is reproducible every single day. Uh, and therefore guaranteeing that we're getting the dose that we want to get, not more, not less. And that improves not just the quality of the care, but it reduces the side effects. So one of our big points of uh, discussion is what do we do when we want to treat uh, a breast that's been reconstructed? The shape is, is uh, not perfect. This is a patient that had a reconstruction after a mastectomy. And this is an expander that's, that's placed in the tissue to, to make the void for the future reconstruction uh, that would be permanent. But I have to treat the skin and the skin is curved in a fairly steep curvature over that uh, expander. So the scar is in the center here in the red and the purple line is really what we want to boost or create the radiation field to treat. So again, traditionally this would be done with electrons and we would have to have multiple beams coming in from different angles, matching on the skin. And that adds not just um, complexity to the treatment, but it adds a little bit of uncertainty. It also adds the potential for overlap or underdosing uh, of uh, that skin tissue just because of the positioning on a daily basis. This is a 3D rendering of a uh, print that was provided by our friends at Adaptive. Uh, so this really just fits over the reconstructed breast uh, perfectly, and therefore you know exactly what depth you're getting anywhere that you're treating on that breast. Uh, it fits perfectly. It's the same every single day. It uh, makes the setup easier for the patients, easier for the therapists. It's quicker, therefore, patient satisfaction and staff satisfaction, but more importantly, it's safer and provides more accurate treatment. 
Uh, when uh, this is again from our friends at Adaptive, uh, you can see that when you put the super flab or the traditional bolus technique over something curved this much, you're going to have these air gaps here. Uh, that's something we want to avoid. And on the uh, the right hand side, you can see how there really is no air gap that it's fitting in nicely, nicely, nice and tight against the skin. And that really is the goal. Uh, different materials are coming out that become uh, that make it easier or harder um, in order to conform or to be more flexible to uh, for breathing or for uh, for areas that need a little bit more flexibility. This is a chest wall reconstruction uh, for a bolus when someone has not had a uh, a breast reconstruction or an expander placed. The tissue is very thin over the chest wall. And we really have to pull that dose out to the skin, so we're not going into the lung or the heart. So this 3D print allows us to put this over the chest wall, and we don't have to put tape or uh, or um, any marks on the skin to get this in the right position because it's essentially indexed, meaning it it locks into the position on the patient by the uh, by their anatomy itself. So what are the benefits to using a 3D? Uh, print for bolus. It's number one, it's customized, uh, which allows it to be more accurate, both for treatment and for the treatment setup. It makes that setup much faster. So something that would take 10, 15 minutes to set up every single day, you can just put this on and it's always in the right place. It makes it perfect uh, every single time. It means that the treatment is more accurate. It doesn't mean the treatment that we do without it is not accurate. It's just we're talking every little minimal bit helps. And the less uh, error that can be imposed by movement or by setup variation uh, means that we reduce side effects. By making the setup faster and the treatment faster, the patient's more comfortable. If you're only on the table for five minutes versus 15 or 20, that's a big deal. It's an innovative approach to old problems. We know that we don't, don't really have a, a, a great situation um, uh, a great solution to these air gaps, but the um, the use of three D printers really hasn't been used clinically in many uh, um, in many areas of radiation because there really hasn't been anyone leading this. So uh, having adaptive um, provide us with the software that allows us to have something that's already approved, already gone through FDA clearance. Um, the solution is validated. Um, so we're using that software approach to allow us to solve some of these issues. Well, because patients are treated faster, the setup is faster, it's more accurate, everyone's happier. It makes treatment planning easier. It makes the patients happier because they're getting in and out faster. They know that their treatment is better. And the staff is happier because they don't have to take as many pictures. They don't have to take as much time to make sure everything is perfect. The therapists spend an awful lot of time on a daily basis making sure that things are perfect within millimeters. Well, if they can take away five, 10 minutes per patient of setting up and validating, um, that's a huge benefit to them. So uh, anything we can do to set, solve any of these problems is wonderful. The next thing I wanna talk about is uh, something called brachytherapy. Now, so everything we've been talking about has been radiation from the outside through, that's created from a big machine called a linear accelerator. It's then directed towards the patient like a beam of light. And all these other techniques we've talked about have been how do we modify that beam of light, whether it's at the point of origin or at the target. Here, we're talking about delivering radiation at the source or at the, tip, at the tumor itself by running catheters parallel or along the tissue surface um, of a tumor or along the skin, we can actually put a radioactive source through these little tubes and have it travel in various positions a certain distance from the skin to treat things that are very close to critical structures. This is very helpful with things that are with tumors that are close to the eye or close to uh, the inner ear. The older technique of doing this is using something called a Friedberg flap. The Friedberg flap is this mesh material, which is little balls that have different diameters so that you can keep these catheters a certain distance from the skin surface. As you can imagine, trying to get these in position on someone that needs to have a, a row of catheters along their skull, um, these are pretty labor intensive. You have to sew them together. You have to 
tape them down. It takes hours to get this in the right position. And then it has to stay in that position when the patient leaves. And you have to bring them back in and uh, do it again uh, for the next patient. And it's it's a very, very labor intensive, uh, but it works very well because when you're treating someone with a tumor that is very close to the eye, you can run these catheters very close to the eye and not have radiation delivered to the structures you want to avoid. But again, huge labor uh, requirement, and it's uh, that labor requirement really invalidates this for most facilities. You just you can't possibly put that amount of time in for one patient uh, and and have to do that same amount of treatment, uh, same amount of setup every single time. It's just it's not possible. So uh, Adaptive has come up with a way to 3D print these. Uh, this is a 3D printed uh, nose uh, brachytherapy, uh, and it's a test. It's not uh, one that's been used that's being used. But what you see here is this is the 3D print bolus material. It's this is rigid, but it has the holes bored right through this through uh, the tissue material itself, and we just send the catheters through those tubes. So we can then use this on areas that have steep curvatures. We can print any part of the anatomy that we want and ask the software to generate these catheter tubes, these catheter holes in various positions. Makes the setup again a breeze. You do the scan to create the anatomy on the computer. You create that bolus material with the catheter uh, channels in it. You print it. Very little needs to be done. It can have the patient's name on it. It gives you the orientation. There's only one way it will fit in. And when the patient has to get treated again, because these are multiple cycle, you have multiple courses or days of treatment, you know it's positioned at exactly the same place each and every time. We can validate it, and these have been validated. Uh, the dose is uh, exactly within 1% of what we're calculating, which is incredible for this type of accuracy for this type of treatment. We're not quite yet at engineering our own organs, although there are people trying um, there uh, for prosthetics. Uh, you can certainly have anything printed that that you want. You, we can actually use the 3D printers that we have to create items that we need in the clinic. If we decide, you know, we would really like to have a uh, a printer uh, print a footholder for a, a certain patient, we can we can do that. Or if someone has a prosthesis, we can print. A, uh, a holder for uh, the for the prosthesis or for the stump or for anything. Basically, you dream it, you can do it now. The the barriers are the size of the printers. The barriers are the size of the or the type of media that you use, and where you want to place it. We have um, many ideas uh, in ways of ways that we can use three D printing. Um, some of the things that we haven't done yet, but we're hoping to do. Uh, if you have a patient that has a tumor uh, that has required a cavity to be formed, where it's whether it's taking out a person's eye or in their mouth, if we could 3D print something to fill that space, that would be perfect. And instead, what we have to do now is manually create something. It may not be perfect. It's it's not it's shaped to their anatomy, uh, but it's not as as exacting as a 3D print. Uh, we are certainly not at 3D printing functioning organs yet, um, but again, that would be uh, the holy grail if we can get to that point. Um, there are people that are working on uh, creating 3D printed trachea, 3D printed esophageal um, uh, structures. Uh, as long as these uh, these uh, materials are, are uh, biocompatible and pass the FDA and can be uh, can be used internally, then essentially, as long as it's not a moving structure, there's really no limit to what can be done. The uh, ability to create a functioning anatomic structure that moves, um, we're not quite there. Um, I imagine at the pace of things, um, hopefully in our lifetime, we'll see something like a functioning heart be printed. But that's uh, my uh, summary for uh 3D printing and how we use it in clinical uh, situations. I wanted to leave a little bit of time uh, for some questions, and I can certainly go back over some of the other information um, as needed. The um, We do have a couple of questions here. Does a healthcare provider 
uh, need a certain specialization or certification to use the 3D printer? No, absolutely not. Um, anyone can use a 3D printer. The, the bigger question is, um, how is it? How is that print going to be used? If you're going to use uh, something that is 3D printed and have it in contact with the patient, then it has to be something that is obviously approved for contact with the patient, um, whether it's uh, sterilizable or FDA approved for contact. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, materials that they're using, uh, that different 3D printers uh, are using, are not either uh, biocompatible or they can be caustic. They can be irritating to the skin. So depending on what we're doing with these uh, 3D prints, we often will um, wrap them in plastic if needed, or they'll be you know, wiped down, uh, or there will be a barrier uh, placed in between uh, the tissue and the patient. The other thing that we can do uh, is we can actually print molds. So if we, if we take uh, something that we want to use uh, internally or, or in a cavity, for instance, if we wanted to put something intraorally, um, the, the prints that are, are made now that we're using are not to, you know, they're really not designed to be in the oral cavity, but we can create a mold of that, for that. We can print this mold out and then fill that mold with silicone, which can be put in the mouth and can be sterilized. So there are, I mean, really the, the, um, there's, there's no limit to what we can do. We, um, we work with um, our, uh, the printer manufacturer that we're working with right now is uh, Form Labs. We currently have a, a Form Lab uh, 2. We're waiting on the Form Lab 3L, which is the large format printer. Um, good question here on how do we validate the uh, 3D uh, print density. Uh, well, most of the 3D print densities are published, uh, but what we do is we actually test everything out ourselves. So we'll, we'll get, um, we'll create a print of the, um, of uh, whatever media it is we wanna use on what's called a phantom, which is an artificial person, whether it's a, a phantom of a head or whatever structure we want, and literally print a test copy of it. Then we do our scan. Um, we uh, create that channel that I had mentioned on the bottom where we can put the dosimeter and we deliver the radiation and we can confirm the density um, that, uh, to be within you know, less than 1% of what is the published rate. It actually doesn't matter to us whether the tissue is exactly tissue equivalent or not. If it's 1.5 the density of the tissue, then we just need less of that print. We can calculate that and print it exactly to what we want. And again, because we can validate that dose, uh, we can customize this however we want. If we um, you know, uh, eventually have a way to print something uh, with a much higher density, then those prints could be even thinner. Uh, but right now we're using things that are around one to 1 1.2 um, uh, uh, density ratio to water or to skin. I hope that, that answers that question. Um, we do have a partnership with uh, UMass as we're, we're affiliated with UMass and their 3D printer lab has many different types of printers and I'm looking forward to our um, further collaborations with, with them. Um, we, uh, we certainly have uh, many ideas on uh, both for the clinical side and for research side, uh, but any ideas and, uh, and uh, questions are, are certainly uh, welcome. Uh, if you don't ask the questions, then we can't come up with solutions for them. So um, I'm a big fan of trying to find new uses for things, um, a big fan of 3D printing and uh, the technology. I think it's just, it's amazing what we can do and as we ramp up the uh, the use of this in more and more patients, uh, I think it, it, people are going to be amazed at what you can do. I already am. Are there uh, any other questions that people may have about either radiation or the 3D printing in general? The um, interesting thing uh, that that we are learning is that um, once you have a solution, you want to use it for everything. So we would love to be able to print. 3D prints for everyone that uh, that walks in the door, but it's not always necessary. Uh, the um, use of the 3D printer obviously is limited. You can only print one product at a time, uh, and it does take time, both on the physics side uh, as well as the uh, printer and engineering side. Uh, and you do have to validate these prints. So uh, while we uh, 
are able to print most of our own prints right now. Um, the uh, adaptive uh, company is uh, um, there. They do have a service where they will uh, send us prints uh, if they're too large for our printer currently to use. Hopefully the um, new printer uh, will be uh, coming out shortly. Uh, it's just been delayed by um, COVID, unfortunately. So if uh, if anyone has quest any further questions or comments, I'm happy to answer them. Um, certainly, um, you know you can you're welcome to email me or to uh, send me any questions if you have them, uh, or call if you don't want to uh, you know ask them now. Uh, but this is uh, something that I hope to be talking more about in the future, and um, hopefully you'll hear more about it as we get closer and closer to uh, customizing everyone's treatment with 3D printing. Thank you, Dr. Yunus. That was really fascinating. Um, I want to thank you for your time and expertise. Could I ask you a quick question? How, how long does it take to make a bolus? You may have covered that. Yeah, it really depends on the printer and on the size and complexity of it. But um, in general, it's an iterative process. So when you, um, the first thing that, that happens just start to finish is a, if a patient comes in that we see needs a 3D print, we have to do a CAT scan of the patient to actually determine the structure itself that we wanna create. So we, cr we recreate the patient in three dimensions on the computer. Then we create the bolus on the computer that we want printed. That structure then, gets exported as a uh, 3D print structure to the software that can generate the bolus. That software then sends uh, the instructions to the printer where it gets printed. The print itself um, takes anywhere from you know, eight to 36 hours. I mean, they, the printers used to be much slower. It would take a day or two and you, know, you, you uh, get to the end of this and uh, of the printing and you say, oh, it's no good or someone bumped the table because they are pretty um, uh, accurate. If someone bumps the table, you got to start over. And so the newer, faster printers that are more uh, well-built and uh, um, they can tolerate a little bit of vibration or imperfect positioning, um, the, uh, the, the prints get are faster, they're, they're uh, more intricate, they can use different colors. But in general, it's the turnaround time is about a, a day or two um, from when we send it to you know, our clinical engineering for printing. Uh, there was a question of who's the who's responsible for the quality control of the prints. So the the quality control of the printer itself um, is all through clinical engineering. Um, the actual prints uh, get validated. Uh, to uh, you know our exacting standards based on the um, uh, the physics of it. So so we we actually internally uh, don't. We, although the companies that create the printers and the media have their own validation and confirm uh, the quality control, we actually validate it all ourselves before it will go anywhere near a patient. So we'll do the testing uh, uh, ourselves. Uh, so have we used SLA and FDM printing? Um, so right now um, that we're using the Forum Labs resin uh, printer. Um, the um, the other uh, there are many different style, types of printer, many different um, uh, deposition models or or for, if, you know ways of creating these uh, prints. Um, right now, uh, you know we're we're limited to um, the ones that can pr produce media that is biocompatible. Um, so we, you can use any type of printing you want if you want to print a mold that you're then going to put the um, uh, silicone uh, gel into. So I think that's probably the way things are going, uh, just because you can really use any type of printer at that point. Um, so where we have access uh, in the future to UMass and a lot of their um, metal printers and large format printers, it's it's going to be just really a question of what's the appropriate um, way to print a individual um, mold. Uh, so I don't really have a, a preferred uh, style, uh, you know, type of printing. It's really the media that we want that determines what type of printer we use. Um, another question, can 3D printing work to make a joint replacement? Well, you know, that's a, it's a great question. So um, it, it, can it be used to make a functioning joint? No, but can it be used to make the parts 
that um, then would be placed in um, when uh, I have no doubt that is already being done uh, because there are silicone um, uh, bushings and things like that that are that are being used uh, in um, joint replacements. If you look at like a knee replacement, um, it's two pieces. There's no there's no actual connection in the joint replacement. It's just the uh, apposition of the two joint of the two structures next to each other with the cartilage and the ligaments holding it all together. Um, so could you print those two individual? Absolutely. And I'm sure that uh, the menisci that are being um, placed in, which are the, the cushions between the bones, uh, they, they I'm sure can be printed if they aren't already. Um, again, that's, you know, we're not talking about something with hinges or anything. We're talking about two anatomic bones it's, uh, that are just closely positioned with a bushing between them. So that I'm sure can be done. Well, thank you very much for uh, thank attending. Thank you. I'm, uh, I hope that uh, people found this useful. I, I look forward to sharing more of what we do with 3D printing over the next uh, you know, four to six months as we start getting into the uh, surface brachytherapy um, and start offering this to more and more patients. Um, it, it's uh, it's a, an exciting time, really. It really is an exciting time. And I uh, am so grateful for your time and your expertise and uh, the visuals that you presented tonight. And as things change and technology advances, we'd love to have you present again. So oh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, have a lovely evening. Our next event will be tomorrow evening with Dr. Collins and Dr. Lipoff. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a good night. Thank you.